Today I'm here with Louise Saunders from Bat Conservation and Rescue Queensland so we can learn more about bats. So Louise, can you tell us um, about this flying fox baby that you've got here and how it came to be in your care? This is Willow and Willow came into care when her mother was caught in backyard fruit tree netting. Uh, her mother was so badly injured that she had to be euthanised and sadly uh, she was carrying her little uh, two week old baby and uh, uh, Willow had to come into care. So Louise, what are some other reasons uh, why bats need rescuing and looking after in Queensland? Uh, bats have many reasons why they uh, uh, need rescuing or coming into care. They can be uh, attacked by dogs, caught on barbed wire, electrocuted. Uh, so whenever you see an electrocuted bat on the power lines, you really should report it because there could be a live baby on board or it could be a hot spot where there's uh, trees going through a power line. So it's really important to call them in. Uh, bats on barbed wire really should be reported as soon as possible because they don't survive um, uh, and we also need to look at whether uh, the food trees can be removed because that's a huge attractant uh, to the barbed wire. Uh, there's lots of other reasons why bats are called in. Uh, sometimes we have micro bats who are um, displaced um, or, or just uh, young, young micro bats. Baby flying foxes come into care uh, only through the months of October through to January and uh, they might be just found underneath a food tree. So um, we, we may be able to reunite them. What are some of the amazing facts about bats that you can share with us? Well, flying foxes are just so important to the environment. If we don't have bats, we don't have trees. So our motto is, um, no me, no tree. And it's that important. They, it, it's well known that uh, they are the pollinators of our hardwood forests and so vitally important for even our rainforests, which are a world heritage rainforests and people come from all over the world to visit them. Flying foxes help keep them uh, healthy and diverse. Uh, they actually, um, the, the flowers of a, a eucalypt tree, they have uh, nectar, which is what the, the flying foxes are drawn for the nectar, and uh, they, they've got very long tongues and they uh, eat, lap up the nectar and as they're doing that, all the little stamens around the flower uh, put pollen around their furry little faces and across their body. And that's how they then travel up to 50 kilometres. And that's how they pollinate the trees, by just dispersing the pollen from one different tree to the other. And uh, our forests are able to hybridise on a scale of no other trees on Earth because of the long distance pollinators. And so flying foxes are vital in our Australian environment to keep our forests healthy and diverse. Louise, bats aren't a popular animal. What would you say to someone to change their mind about how they feel about bats? I'd like people to just understand uh, some of the, the, um, the disease uh, risks. And uh, if you don't touch bats, you have nothing to fear. The virus is in less than half a percent of the free living, uh, healthy flying foxes. So the risk is very minimal, but if you're not handling them, you have nothing to fear. Um, as bat carers, we're all vaccinated against Australian bat lysivirus, which is a rabies vaccine, and that protects us uh, to do our rescue job. And uh, so we just ask the public not to handle them. But um, they're quite amazing animals, and we just would like people to uh, find out a little bit more about them. And once you know a lot more about flying foxes, uh, and you know about the risks and about how amazing they are, um, you find out that they're truly an amazing animal and uh, a very worthy Australian mammal and worthy of, of great protection and uh, care. A lot of people talk about the dispersal of bats. Can you tell us what this means? Yeah, a dispersal is where people want to remove flying foxes from their, their place of, that they're living. So a dispersal is usually where the, they wait for the flying foxes to leave for the night and then they come in and they cut the trees, uh, some trees down, mostly the roost trees and then um, uh, in the morning when the flying foxes come back in, usually three or four o'clock in the morning, they use lots of noise. So um, they have used all sorts of things like uh, lawn mowers and um, leaf blowers, even um, sirens to keep the the flying foxes away from, from that area.
very distressing on the flying foxes and they just don't understand uh, they've come back to their home and their home's gone. So it's very distressing and they have to find somewhere else to go. And usually it could be the school ground or the churchyard and uh, they may be a lot harder to manage once they go to those other areas. So uh, dispersals don't usually work and uh, there's a, there are a lot of effort uh, goes into trying to move flying foxes when it usually doesn't work and it, it can uh, have a lot of negative effects on flying fox populations. Louise, some people think that if bats live close to a residential area, the colony should be dispersed or moved on. How do you respond to that point of view? Well, I, I think that uh, we have to educate the people who live near flying fox colonies and, uh, and get them to understand the risks of, of uh, having flying foxes close, as there is no risk to having flying foxes living near you. It's about educating people to um, not touch bats and about diseases. But dispersals um, often don't work and it's about um, people and developments moving closer to flying foxes. It's not usually flying foxes moving into an area where people are. It's usually uh, developments coming in and encroaching on flying fox habitat. So there's things that we can do to stop um, people worrying about flying foxes. We could plant more trees so that there's less noise coming through um, the bushland. We could have air conditioning and double glazing on their windows so that they don't hear the flying foxes or smell uh, the smells that some people find offensive. But uh, usually uh, there are ways that we can learn to live with wildlife instead of uh, constantly harassing them and uh, potentially um, having them, them die through lots and lots of dispersal action. What do you enjoy about being a bat carer? Well, it's little animals like this that make being a bat carer so much fun. This is a miniature flying fox and we often don't get to see them. So uh, when a rescue comes in, you don't know what you're going to go to rescue. And this one happened to be a little tiny blossom bat, which is a tiny wee miniature flying fox. And of course, everyone knows about our mega bats and uh, it's about um, just the quirky, funny little characters. Every flying fox have its, has its own individual personality and they're such beautiful animals once you get to know them. And what don't you enjoy? Oh, it's the cruelty. It, and it's cruelty that can be avoided. For example, backyard fruit tree netting. There's a great alternative to using this killer netting. And uh, it, it, you just don't, you shouldn't be using it. It's a horrible thing and it kills bats so completely. So as a rescuer, we're confronted continually by the pain and the suffering of flying foxes, either in the netting or on barbed wire, or just being left alone to die. It's, it, you just cannot allow it to happen. And our job is forever and we're so busy. We, we attend almost 2,000 rescues a year and uh, you know we can average four and five rescues a day, up to 20 a day when little baby flying foxes can be found on the ground or hanging on power lines with their mother. So it's a very tough job and it's a, it's a very hard job too. Um, but when we raise a baby flying fox, that's the icing on the cake and that makes us want to keep doing it because uh, they're animals that deserve better and, uh, and at every rescue have, we have the potential to educate people and we can actually make a difference and we can change people's attitudes and we can uh, stop animal suffering by taking away the barbed wire or the backyard fruit tree netting so that our bats can live a happier life with human beings. What can students do to help the bats? Uh, look, they can do lots of things. The first thing is go to the internet and learn as much as you can about how amazing these animals are. And then just um, make sure that if you, ever you see a bat alone, you, d you don't touch, but you call someone and uh, get that little bat rescued because uh, no one deserves to have the pain and suffering of, of being left alone and dying. So um, it's about 
learning what you can about these amazing animals. And we want more kids to grow up and be scientists and do lots of research. Um, if, if we were to say how much we know about these animals, it's about this much. We want to learn this much about them. There's so much we don't know. So we need um, lots of little bat ambassadors uh, to find out a lot more about flying foxes and to understand them and to protect them for the future because we need them and our forests cannot live without them. Oh, and the other thing they can do is actually report every electrocuted bat that you see on the power lines. There are, way, are things that uh, we can do to stop more bats being electrocuted at that spot and uh, there may be a live baby on board so we could even name the baby after you or after your mum or dad, <laughs> that would be fun. Um, but also uh, think about um, looking at the ways people protect fruit crops. So if your neighbour is using the, the bad stuff, um, maybe we could get them to use the good stuff. Or even your grandpa or parents might be using the bad stuff and uh, you might like to tell them all about uh, hail guard, which is uh, something that you can use that doesn't hurt flying foxes because that's what we need is to have our flying foxes happy uh, flying around our suburbs not getting caught or injured.